Let's open our Bibles to Psalm 73. Psalm, excuse me, Psalm 73. In this psalm, we have the divinely inspired words of a man named Asaph. Asaph, in this song, reflects on a time in his life when he almost turned away from God. And he goes on in the psalm to tell us why he almost turned away. And he also tells us why he chose to stay faithful to God. The psalm is unique in the sense that it begin, begins with the conclusion. Typically, of course, we're expecting a conclusion at the end, but here the conclusion is at the beginning. He says, truly God is good to Israel, even to those who are, are of a clean heart. So the conclusion of this is, God is good to those who are faithful. But now as we read on, we see that he does talk about the time when he thought about turning away from God. And in verses 3 through 14, he explains why. And in his explanation of why he started to turn away from God, we find four errors. Four errors. So let's read those verses. First of all, verse 2. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. Now verse 3. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasses them about as a chain. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them, and they say, How does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly, <clears throat> excuse me, who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. So again, why did he think about turning away? Four errors. Number one is this in verse 3. Because he was envious of those who were disobeying God. He was focused on the world. And he saw those who were disobeying, disobeying God and it seemed like they were pretty well off. Verse 3. I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Error number 2. Verse 3 and verse 12. We just read verse 3, we read verse four, uh, 12 again. Behold, these are the ungodly who have prosper in the world, they increase in riches. Error number two, he started to turn back away from God because he chose the wrong standard. He looked at the people of the world and he saw they were enjoying the wicked, some of the wicked ones were enjoying material prosperity. And he determined that must be the standard of success. And what was happening with him? Well, as we read on, we find out that he wasn't as prosperous. And things weren't as smooth for him. So maybe he needs to go, or maybe I need to go, Asaph says to himself. Maybe I need to go try the world out for a little bit. Error number three, verses four through seven. While he was thinking about going back into the world, he exaggerated the easiness, quote unquote, of the life of the disobedient. See in verses four through seven, there are no bands in their death, their strength is firm, they're not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasses them about as a chain, violence covers them as a garment, their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than heart could wish. He looked at the, the wicked people around him who were enjoying prosperity. He said, well, that's a pretty good life. I got, they've got the money they need. They've got the, all the 
prosperity they could wish for. They, nothing goes bad for those folks. Error number four. In verses 13 and 14. Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. Since he was not enjoying the same prosperity and ease of life that the disobedient were, he determined that trying to live a righteous life was just a waste of time. And that was error number four. The disobedient have it made, he thought. They get what they want, they do what they want, and they live great lives. In fact, you go back to verse 11, he says, and God doesn't do anything about it. God doesn't seem to care. These are the thoughts that nearly took him away from faithfully following God. And there was one more. There was one more. And he almost committed this error, but he stopped short. And that's in verse 15. He said, if I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. You see, up to this point, as he reflects on that time in his life, he, he says, I kept it inside me. All these thoughts I was having about how much easier it would be to just follow the world. He kept it inside of him, but he thought about telling others why he was going to stop following God faithfully. But then he considered the possibility that in doing so, he might cause others to stumble. And so in verse 16, the logical progression of this is an inner conflict. On one hand, he wants to follow God because God has been good to him. But on the other hand, he's tired of the abuse. He's tired of not being among the prosperous in the world in ways. And so he says in verse 16, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. He had no one on earth he could turn to. You ever had that happen? And so we come to verse 17. And verse 17 is what you might call, if you make notes in your Bible, the turning point. Verse 17 is the turning point. He says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. That statement was the critical moment in the life of Asaph. That statement is also the answer to the question, what should I do if I start turning away from God? Asaph needed some answers. But Asaph needed answers that only God could provide. You know, if you go to a worldly-minded person, one who is disobedient to God, and you ask him or her what to do in matters of faith, they're always going to give you the wrong answer. There is only one source of the right answer for us spiritually, and that's God. So we find Asaph thinking about going away from God, then stopping to realize, well, let me go to God first. And folks, that was the exact right thing to do. When an athlete starts losing some ability, maybe isn't playing as well as he or she has been or likes to, what do they do? 
Well, I don't know what every one of them does, but I know for a fact that some of the best of them, when they're not playing their game like they want to play their game, they work harder. They don't turn away from it, they work harder. So I suggest that what we have here in the message from Asaph is that if we find ourselves drifting away from God as Christians, if we find ourselves considering slacking off here or there, then instead of doing that or instead of going to see what our friends and neighbors in the world think, that we turn back to God with more intensity than we ever have. And we pray more earnestly and we spend more time in God's word. That's exactly what Asaph did. And in doing so, back to the verses here, in doing so, in turning back to God to get the answers, Asaph learned some very important truths. In verses 18 through 20, Well, let's go ahead and read. Yes, yeah, start with 18. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. Asaph learned some truths here because of his experience and because of turning to God. Truth number one that he learned was this. The supposed prosperity of the disobedient is temporary if it exists at all. Dare we say that one is prosperous simply because he has money? No. Or because he has fame or she? No. Truth number one that Asaph realized was that those who are living for the world and living for, for Satan instead of living for God are in a slippery place. He said he almost slipped away. Well, they're on that slippery slope. And their prosperity, such as they call it, is only temporary because judgment is coming. Verse 27, for lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go away from you. Truth number two that Asaph learned through this experience and through turning to God. Truth number two in verses 21 and 22 and then the beginning of verse 26 he says, thus my heart was grieved, I was pricked in my reins, so foolish was I and ignorant, I was as a beast before you. Verse 26, the first line, my flesh and my heart fails. Truth number two, we are helpless without God. I was as ignorant as a beast. I didn't know what to do. Truth number three, verses 23 through 26. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have hold, held me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Who do I have in heaven but you? There is none upon earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart fails, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all them that go away from you. Truth number three is this. And again, keep in mind, this is right on the heels of truth number two. Truth number two is that we can't do it by ourselves. Truth number two portrays Asaph's situation where he was seriously thinking about turning away from God. And in spite of that, in spite of the fact that he was thinking about turning away from God, God remained faithful to him. And that's truth number three. God is faithful to us and will be with us. The world nearly pulled Asaph away. And it's still pulling at God's people.
1 Peter 5 and verse 8 says, Our adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, is walking around seeking to devour us. The world is still pulling at us. But I love verse 28 as we conclude and point out the fact that the answers we need when we're facing challenges in life or when we even think about not following God anymore, the answers we need are by turning, we find by turning to God. Because verse 28 says, it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. It is good for me to draw near to God. Some centuries later, another inspired writer came along and he wrote these words in James 4 and verse 8. Draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. I can't think of anything more precious than that promise. Tonight, as we consider the event in the life of Asaph in Psalm 73, especially addressing those who are Christians. Shall we all take a look at our lives to determine if we're walking faithfully with God, if we're growing in Him and getting closer to Him, or if we're little bit by little bit, as Ricky talked about not too long ago in one of his lessons, is our faith being chipped away? It's only one place to go. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If we can help you as a child of God, we can pray with you and for you as you live your life in Christ. We'll do that. If you're not a Christian yet, we invite you to be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to believe that Jesus is Christ, the son of God, as Jesus said we must in John 8, 24. If you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. To repent of sins, as in Luke 13 and verse 3, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. To make a confession of faith in Jesus as Christ, for with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10 and verse 9. And then be immersed in Christ for the forgiveness of sins, as was done, taught and done in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. We're thankful for the time we have here together this evening. May God bless us in his service and may we be more diligent every day. And if you'd like to respond to this invitation, we invite you to come while we sing.